words of uncertainty. You want to be very certain about your goal. So you want to avoid words like try and might. And this can be a very hard thing to do um, because sometimes we've been conditioned by culture and society to use certain terminology that maybe we don't intend in our heart for it to be what it sounds like, but if we trace it back to the source, it comes from the world system and is not kingdom of God language. So it's not, I'm trying to lose weight. It's, I'm losing weight. It's not, I believe I'm healed. I'm healed. Amen. See, you see that, see that, see that subtle difference in certainty there? Uh, sometimes, not all the time, and I'm not a confession cop, but sometimes when we proceed phrases with I'm believing, if we're not, if we're not careful, we negate what is. So I'm not trying to lose weight. I'm losing weight. I'm not trying to start a business. I'm in the process of starting a business. See the difference there? So we've got to learn to speak with certainty. James chapter 5 verse 12 says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. We want to be a matter of fact about the condition. We want to say what is. We want to learn to get out of try and might and maybe to say this is the way it is. This is it. This is what's happening. This is what's going on. This is my condition. So let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Learn to speak with certainty. For many people, writing, speaking, and proclaiming is a great starting place for goals to become a reality. For many people, writing, speaking, and proclaiming is a great starting place for goals to become reality, especially when there are no resources in the natural that you currently see right now to bring them to pass. A lot of people struggle with even starting out on their dream or on their goal because they don't see the resources they think it would take for that to come to pass and so they don't do anything. So Brian, what can I do if the resources have not manifested yet? You can write the vision, make it plain, you can speak it, declare it, and you can proclaim it. You want to write, speak, and proclaim, and let that be the starting place of actually executing on your goal, of actually executing on your dream. And again, like we said last night, you will be amazed at how resources rise to meet your level of commitment, how resources rise to meet your level of seriousness. When we become serious about our goals, when we become serious about our dreams to the point of making a plan and planning, you will be amazed how sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly the resources begin to rise to meet your level of commitment. List benefits, list consequences, and motivations. What are the benefits of achieving your goals for you and for others? Sometimes the achievement of your goals is a release for someone else. We talked about that Sunday. Who knows but that your goal is a puzzle piece that needs to be put into the puzzle before someone else can put their piece in. When we realize how many others will benefit from our efforts, we'll have a higher sense of purpose, one beyond personal ambition alone. We are blessed to be a blessing. If earning a million dollars in one year is your goal, write down what accomplishing that will mean to you, but not only to you, to your family, your church. If you have a million dollars right now, what's a tithe on a million dollars? A hundred thousand dollars. How will that 
be a blessing to the church? What will the church be able to do with multiple people bringing $100,000 into the church? The resources that the church will have. So what will it mean to you, your family, your church, or other charities that you support? If owning a beautiful beachfront condo in Hawaii is your goal, what benefits would that provide? What are the consequences of not achieving your goals? What would it cost you? What regrets would you have to get to the end of your life or the end of your journey and realize that you've not accomplished any of your dreams? What regrets would you have? This can help motivate you to continue doing the things that will lead to the fulfillment of your goals. How many times have we thought, if I only understood the consequences of that decision before I made it, I would have made a different decision. Understanding the consequences of making a wrong decision or inactivity of not making a decision at all can be powerful motivators. Being being conscious of the benefits and consequences of achieving or not achieving our goals can be powerful motivators. So the next exercise that we have here, and again, you can take your time and do this at home. Um, If you haven't already done the previous exercise that we came across in our notes, um, please uh, do so uh, soon. Uh, and that's your goals exercise. But here, here's another exercise, benefits and consequences. List 10 to 20 benefits you or others will likely enjoy when you reach your goal. Not only how will you feel, but how will people associated with you feel and people that are hooked up, connected to you feel and be blessed, um, primarily your family, but then also other people around you. The first 10 might be easy. It may get more difficult as you get to 20, but push through. The more benefits you see, the more motivated you will be. When you understand the value and the benefits that achieving your goals will bring, it will motivate you. The next part of this is list at least five serious consequences that will result if you fail to reach your goal. Be real. These may be your catalyst for change. Sometimes we need to kick in the butt to get going. And sometimes understanding the serious consequences of not doing the things that God has called us to do and what our lives will look like not doing those things can be a very strong kick in the butt, can be a catalyst for change. All right. So now we're moving into session two. Starting point, completion, and boundaries. When you have a dream, one of the first things that you want to do, when you set a goal, one of the first things that you want to do is you want to analyze your starting point. Because your journey may look like this. But you've always, you always have a starting point. And There may be a lot that needs to happen in between here and here. There may be a little that needs to happen between here and there. But we need to analyze where we are in reference to achieving that goal. One person may be all the way here, but another person may be starting right there. But understanding where you are will help you ascertain what needs to be done, right? Because you may look at your life and look at your current circumstances and situation, and you may already be ahead of the game just by some of the things that you've done that you've done in previous years, right? And so your starting point may be beyond where someone else is. And then I always tell people, Don't compare yourself to other people when it comes to achieving this goal, right? They may be right here, right? But if you've never ventured into this, you may be starting right here, right? And you're going to need to make, as we said Sunday, incremental steps and have incremental wins and successes along the way. So don't be discouraged if 
You know, some people walk into a church like this and hear the things that are going on, hear the things that God is doing and look at themselves and go, man, I'm I'm not anywhere near where these people are in terms of faith and vision and purpose and um, character and family. I'm, you know, well, one thing you have to understand is that some of the people that you see winning in their family, winning in their bodies, winning in their careers, um, winning in their personal character, winning in ministry. Some of these people, they've been doing this for years. They've been pursuing this for years. They've been making adjustments and changes and switches for years. If you're just starting out, then you're going to have to find some sort of satisfaction in getting to this point, you know, and be able to celebrate small wins and small successes and, and set a reward for yourself. Say, if I get to this point, then I'm going to celebrate in this way. Why? Because it doesn't always have to be a sprint. It can be a marathon. Our attitude should be, I've got at least as a believer, this, is the, this, this should be the mindset of a believer. I have at least 120 years to be able to look back and say, I ran my race. I finished my course. I accomplished the dreams that God gave me. I accomplished the goals that God gave me. Unfortunately, the mindset... This is supposed to be a brain. The mindset of the world system, for the most part, begins to shut down around age 70. Right? And so, as they start approaching the age 70, you know, you start getting to 50, 55, 60, and... You, you starting to think it's it's all downhill from here, that it's that it's that it's now over. Um, and that's when some people may start to unplug from life. They start to unplug from ambition. They start to unplug of from um, setting goals. Um, but our mindset as believers is that, you know what? I've got at least 50 more years here uh, to get things done and to do things that I've always dreamt about doing. And then after 120 years is over, then, you know, we'll see after that. But that should be the mindset of a believer is that, you know what? Um, this doesn't have to be a sprint. It can it can, it, can, it, can, it can be a marathon. The prize is not given to the swift, but to he who endures until the end, right? So if, if it takes you a little bit longer to get there, that's fine. Just stay committed to it. Don't quit. If you don't quit, what? You win. If you don't quit, you win. So analyze your starting point. Understanding your starting point allows you to understand what your next step should be. What should my next steps be in accomplishing this goal? Well, it's going to depend upon where you're starting at, right? Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 32. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So the thought here is that we need to understand what we have to work with and where we're starting, right? Right. Um, most of us start our journeys with limited resources and knowledge. But that's okay. Don't despise small beginnings. You may start small, but you'll finish big. Okay? It's okay to start small, again, to make incremental steps and successes. And they may be so small and tiny, the natural mind, the unrenewed mind says there's no value in that. You know, 
I want, I want the big thing, right? When you're learning how to play the piano and they're teaching you, and you're like, no, that's not why I came to you to take piano lessons. I want to play Mozart. You want to play Mozart? Then, you know, so uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't do it all at once. You don't, you don't despise small beginnings. Uh, Brian, I want a big ministry. I want to I want to minister to thousands and tens of thousands of people and I want to be on network television and um, I don't want to teach the kids in Sunday school. That's not not quite what (laughs) the dream I had in mind. Um, Don't despise small beginnings. Uh, Brian, I want a big church and I want to pastor a big church. Uh, I don't want to usher. I don't want to do that. But um, I want to do I want to do the big thing. I don't want to clean toilets, but I do want to be on stage um, conducting praise and worship to tens of thousands of people and having concerts. Um, There are lessons that you learn going from here to here that build character and values that you're going to need to sustain you once you start taking on these bigger things, right? And that's why you see so many people crash and burn when they get here because they sought and found a back door to get and jump over here without following the Holy Spirit. And there's no character and integrity within them to withhold what they're now taking on. So don't despise small beginnings. Define completion and what success looks like. What does success look like for your dream? Defining completion and success allow you to know when you've reached your goal and prevents you from making unnecessary efforts and pursuing things that don't align with the vision. It also keeps us from complaining and being frustrated over the wrong thing. How do you know if you're a success if you've never defined what success looks like. If success for your ministry looks like being the premier uh, church for praise and worship in the country, if that's what success looks like for you and that's what you defined as success, then don't don't worry about uh, what other churches are doing and try to monitor and mimic their successes. Why? Because that's not that's not your success. Um, someone asked me, you know, how youth ministry is going. And, you know, I had to I had to look at the youth ministry. And when I did, uh, I had to go back to what success looks like for the youth ministry. Right. Because if I don't go back to what was defined as success, then I may get off into thinking that I've not that we've not reach certain things, right? So if success looks like uh, 2,500 teenagers, then obviously we failed or we're failing. We're falling short of that. If that's what success looks like, right? But if we decide, if we define success as youth maturing and growing in their relationship with God and in the kingdom of God, and then being able to go out and be equipped and be lights that shine the darkness and be strong, tough, and noticeably different and be able to stand against the tide and exert godly influence in, their, in, in, in the atmospheres that, that, that they're in and be able to answer questions that people are asking them and be able to sit in a class at a university with a professor spouting off lies and be able to stand against that because the truth is on the inside of them, then to see that's another measuring stick, right? If my goal as a ministry is to have Uh, you know, 1,200 people and I've got 200, right? Then if that's, if, if that's what success looks, looks like, then, you know, maybe I have not reached that yet. 
But if success looks like something else, right, and I've defined that already, uh, then that's where my that, that that's where my focus should be, right? And when we don't define what does success look like for our family, if we don't define that, then what we what we start doing is we start comparing our family to other people's families, and we and we let them define success for us. Well, success looks like this. Well, I hear so and so they're doing this, and this family has this, and they do this during the summers, and you know they have they have they have this, and you know the you know all the kids are gone gone to college, and you know the, you know you start you, you start looking at other people and what they call success, and if you're not where they are, then now you're frustrated. But if you go back to what you wrote down as what success looks like for your family you may realize that you're right there in the plan of God, that you're right there with what God told you to do. You want God to be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You don't get there by comparing yourself to other people, other institutions or other entities. You've got to stay true to yourself. You've got to stay true to what God has called you to be and what God has called you to do. Now, we talked about Maximum dream achievement is being a God dream. Now, there's something that we've heard in culture called the American dream, right? The American dream is a big red brick house with a white picket fence and 2.5 children and, you know, having this and having this and having this, right? Um, But that may not necessarily be the dream that God has given you, right? There may be specific things that don't even tie to the American dream, that God has put on the inside of you to burn in your heart. And so you've got to use what God put on the inside of you and define that as success, right? Um, How do you know if your business is successful, right? Have you defined revenue numbers for that business for the year, right? Um, If you were looking to do, you know, $50,000 in revenue that year, um, and that's what and that's what you wrote down. But then you see other businesses around you that are doing two hundred that did two hundred thousand dollars that year. And you go, wow, I'm such a failure here. No. What did you define? What the success look? You don't you, you, you don't know if you even got there unless you define what it looks like to get there. Right. And those businesses may have been in place for, you know, decades. Right. You may just be starting out. So a quick win for you may be fifty thousand dollars in revenue for that first year. That's 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 your success. That's what success looks like for you. You may have children and all kids are different. Right. All, 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 all kids are different, and so you can't measure the success and growth patterns of your children based upon how other children progress, right? You can't measure the success of your child and what they do after they graduate from high school. Do they go to college? Do they go to the military? Do they start? Do they enter the workforce? Do they enter ministry? Do they go on mission trips? Whatever. Well, all the other parents, children, they're doing this. And I hear, you know, my neighbor talking about Johnny and how, you know, how wonderful Johnny's, you know, doing in college. And, you know, uh, you know, he's, he's got this great, great job making, you know, all this money. And we're so, we're so, we're so proud of Johnny. If you're not careful, you start to look at your child, Susie, and you go, well, Susie's not doing this and she's not doing that. And she's not doing this. Well, what is Susie doing? Well, she's doing this and she's pursuing her dream and uh, she's, she's making progress in this area. But it just doesn't look like what 99 percent of other people's kids are doing. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to look like what Susie's doing and what God has called Susie to do and what God has called Susie to be. Right. So but but you're not going to know what success looks like for your child until you've heard from God and understand what they're bent and calling is and are able to define that and walk them through that. They may not go to college. If I had to redo it again, I might not have gone to college. You don't have to go to college to be successful. What makes a success is God. And understanding the bent, the dream, the talent, the gift, the things that God has put on the inside of you, having a relationship with him, following him, pursuing him, being obedient to the Holy Spirit, walking through the doors that he opens for you, 
listening to his voice, being submitted to authority, mentoring under somebody, learning from people who've done it before, and reduplicating the principles that brought them the successes that they have. And if that includes going to college, then great. If that includes getting a degree, then great, so be it. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are many ways to be successful without obtaining a bachelor's, master's, or PhD degree. And what a waste it would be to spend four years, six years, eight years, 10 years doing something that wasn't necessary, spending money that wasn't necessary to do what God had called you to do, right? So what does success look like for you, for your household, for your business, for your ministry? Be able to write that down to find what the success look like. That way you know when you get there and you don't start getting frustrated about not being somewhere that you weren't even supposed to be to begin with. You don't start getting frustrated about not pursuing activities that other people are pursuing when you weren't even called to pursue them to begin with. What sort of boundaries will keep you on track? Establish them up front and expect the Holy Spirit to keep you in bounds. So if you've got a goal of losing uh, 20 pounds in the next six months, what sort of boundaries would that take? What sort of boundaries might that take? You need to establish them up front. If you've got a weakness for Twinkies, you know, you may want to make sure, although they've reduced the calories in Twinkies anyway, um, by 10 calories. Uh, but anyway, if you've got a weakness for Twinkies and it's eating 12 boxes of Twinkies every week that got you to where you are, right? then you may want to stop bringing Twinkies into the house. That is a boundary that you'll need to set free for yourself, right? Now, your brother or your sister in Christ, they may handle Twinkies just fine, and they may have Twinkies at their house. But that has nothing to do with you. It's about what you and where your weakness might be, right? One person can drink wine, the other person can't. One person can have Twinkies, the other person can't. It's about... It's about you, right? So if Twinkies got you in trouble, then you may, want, you may not want to bring Twinkies into the house. See, now we're getting back into infrastructure, right? Um, but that may be a boundary that you set, all right? No more Twinkies for the next six months, all right? And um, that means, depending on how disciplined you are or aren't, you may not want to go down to Twinkie Isle. You know, where all the little Debbies and the cupcakes and the cookies, you know, ding dongs. You might, you might, you might, you might want to avoid that aisle, right? Um, that may that 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 may be a boundary for you. Um, you may have some spending boundaries. If you've got some financial goals, you may have some spending boundaries that you want to implement. And it's important. It's better to implement your boundaries up front. That way, when you're tempted. You've already heard yourself say it. You already have it written down on paper, paper, and you sort of instilled those things to say, you know what? I'm going to make sure that the right infrastructure is in place for me to accomplish my goals, right? So if it's no Twinkies, then it's no Twinkies. If it's, uh, if it's raining and spending, then, you know, you rain in spending. You know, if you spend $1,000 a month on eating out, you may want to cut that down. Um, you know, you can give yourself a raise, you know, if if you're spending a thousand dollars a month on eating out and, uh, you know, if if you've got if you've got, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of money to handle that eating out ab habit and you're free to do that, then, then great. But if you're if you're like if you're like right here and you're trying to make some inroads and some progress and you're working on getting out of, I use the word trying, see, it's, 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 it's habitual. Anyway, um, but you're making inroads, you're making inroads into, into that, that journey, that dream, then you may not be able to spend the way people who have already gotten down here spend. 
Well, Brian, I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses. I'm trying to do what they do. <laughs> There's a term they use in, uh, um, on the basketball court and in the hip hop uh, culture, and it's, it is, and it's called do you. They say do you, and that's not proper English, but um, anyway. But um, basically it's, uh, well, Pastor said it before, be who you be. Be who you be, say true to yourself. And so um, you may not yet, now this is just yet, you may not yet be at the point where you need to be spending $1,000 a month on eating out. You know, what if you cut that down by half? You know, and it was $500 a month. That's a $6,000 annual raise you just gave yourself. To now take that and apply to your goal, right? Your true goal, right? So whether it's getting out of debt, whether it's uh, putting, putting more resources to another goal, maybe you got a goal of building a deck for your house, you know? Um, you, might have, you, might, you might have the resources and you're just allocating them in a way that shouldn't be allocated, come on, come on. right? It's amazing what we, if we take, if we take inventory of what resources we really have that are improperly allocated, right? One thing that uh, Holly and I just started doing is um, we started allocating our first $1 million, right? So we, st we, we've, we started saying where this is going to go, 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 and eventually we'll do it all the way down to the penny, right? What are we doing? We're earmarking the first $1 million, right? The first, the, the first $1 million of net worth. Why? Because borrow vessels from your neighbors, borrow not a few. And when you've got something to put something in, it's amazing how it'll come when you make room for it. But when the vessel stopped, the oil stopped, right? So, uh, you may want to start to earmark where different things going. What are you doing? You're planning. You're coming up with a strategy. You're showing that you're serious about receiving and embracing what's coming, right? And again, it's amazing how situations, circumstances, conversations, and creation will arise to your level of seriousness and your level of commitment and what you write down and the plan that you make. So you may want to earmark it. Um, one thing that Holly and I began to do a few, a few years ago is um, we, um, we started a vacation. We opened a vacation account. And, um, uh, you know, we wanted to travel and to be able to travel, and uh, we didn't have any money to travel. So we opened an account with no money. We opened an account with no money. Uh, before, we didn't have dedicated vacation money. Now there's vacation money in the vacation account, right? It's, 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 it's amazing how things will come when you make a place for them, right? When Brianna was born, Holly and I immediately opened up an account for Brianna, right? Why? So we can start putting what's coming for Brianna and resources and money and wealth away for her right now, right? We're making a place. And you know what? There's money in her account. Now, there's not as much money as, there's go as there's, there is going to be, but it's, uh, it's what? It's, it's, it's analyzing a starting point, understanding what it is, and then making a place for it. Right? So we've got, I don't know how many accounts we have now. Um, we've, got, we've, got a, we've got a number of accounts um, for different things. Um, but, uh, you know, you want to start to set things up and get things in place. Look, God will do his part. I'm sorry, I'm up here spitting. God will do his part, but you've got to do your part. Okay? You've got to make a place. Your part is to make a place, be obedient to the Holy Spirit, develop a plan, hear from God concerning the plan, Follow the nuances of the Holy Spirit, the promptings. Make adjustments to your plan as you go. You may realize that you are off in a certain area. That's okay. It's okay to be off as long as you don't stop, as long as you're still moving. It's okay to make a mistake 
as long as you don't quit, as long as you continue to move, right? It's the people that stop. If you're stopped and you're not doing anything and there's no activity, you can guarantee nothing's going to happen outside of a miracle. All right. Set a deadline, set a starting date, and the stopwatch. Without deadlines, we can easily succumb to any of a number of anti-goal achieving activities such as procrastination and distraction. It is easy for us to put off important things and trade our time for more menial and even unnecessary activities. Deadlines give us a sense of urgency. When it's time to do something, we need to make haste. Now, there's something about, there's something to say for being patient. There is something to say for quote unquote, waiting on God and not getting ahead of God, not trying to go from, you know, step one to step eight and one big step, but following the Holy Spirit and making gradual step and gradual step as needs to be made. There's something to say for waiting on God, but when you hear from God and God says, go, you need to be ready to go. You need to be ready to move on his time frame, right? So when it's time to do something, we need to make haste and do it. Do it as quickly as possible. When you've got the release to do it, do it as quickly as possible. Time is of the essence. Okay. Um, the earth in its current form will not always be here. There will be a new earth. All right. And um, uh, why um, you may live for, um, you know, 120, 130, 150 years. Um, if uh, you choose to go home earlier than earlier than that. Um, but the point is this. You aren't going to be here in this form, in this fashion, on this earth for eternity. There's going to be a transfer. Time is going to stop the way, the way, the way we know it now at some point in time, right? So uh, we've got to make the most of our time, right? We've got to uh, redeem the time. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16 says, so time is of the essence. Um, it is easy for us to be busy and accomplish little or nothing. You ever felt like uh, you did a lot but didn't do anything? Um, you know, we used to have a uh, joke a few years ago um, in some of the ministries that we were involved in, and um, it was a thing about uh, uh, making an annual. And that is um, uh, we, would have, we would have an event, and God would move powerfully and tremendously, and, uh, and then all of a sudden it became an annual. And uh, we expected God to do the same thing he did the year before, right? But the next year it's not the same, right? Uh, what happened? Uh, we tried to build a, a, a temple or a tabernacle a, a, that, in something that was for one moment and one season, but God had something else for the next year. But we were trying to, we were trying to reduplicate what God did, and that can't be the motivation of, of, of what you do. That, 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 that can't be how you handle the encounters of God and the experience of, of God is to, you know, set up an altar there and just, you know, stay right there. We've got we've to we've be able to move um, when God says move. And, in, and sometimes when that happens in, in, those, in those endeavors, you find yourself doing a lot of work to put these things together, right? And uh, you feel like, oh, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're, do, we're doing this. And then after we were done, you know, we all felt tired and we felt like we did a lot. But then the actual event happened and, um, and uh, it was like uh, a dud. It was like, what happened? Last year it was good. What happened? You know, it was it, that, that anointing wasn't there. The flow wasn't there. What happened? The motivation was wrong. Now, um, there will be there will be times where God t tells you that this should be 
a annual and yearly thing. This should be a regular thing. This should be an ongoing thing. This should be an ongoing activity, whether weekly, monthly, a quarterly, or um, yearly. And that's fine if God tells you that. The point that I'm making is that um, you don't want to try to um, reduplicate out of the flesh something that God did when God didn't say reduplicate it. OK, so and and when you when you do that, you find yourself turning your wheels and you're very busy and you're doing a whole lot. But then you feel like you aren't accomplishing anything. So we want to move from being busy to being effective. Um, you can have someone who does 10 things. And then you can have someone who does one thing and they both accomplish the same result. Right. Because the person who did 10 things may have been trying to figure it out. And by chance hit on something that would work. The person who did one thing. Waited until they heard from God. Moved when God said moved and knocked it out of the park that one time because they waited till they heard from God. Right. And they didn't go through all the effort that the person who did 10 things went through, right? The person who did 10 things may have the testimony, oh, it's tough serving the Lord. It's tough serving the Lord. Be careful you don't get burned out. You got to do a lot of stuff. You got to, you got to, you know, you got to, got to keep it going. The other person's testimony is, hey, I don't get burned out. All I do is pretty simple. I hear from God and I do what he says. He says, say this, and I say this. He says, go here, and I go here. He tells me to stop, I stop. He tells me to go, I go. He tells me to sleep, I sleep. He tells me to eat, I eat. Um, there's something to say for being more efficient about the way we order our lives, to move from being busy to being effective. Does this really have to get done this week? Is this really a priority? Do we really need to be running back and forth to all this stuff? Do we really need to do this in the house this week? Would our time be better spent doing this? Can we get more bang for our buck doing this instead of doing this? And so we may want to take a step back at some of the stuff that we're doing and how we're... See, we may be doing the right thing, but the way that we're approaching it may be off, right? So you may need to occasionally step back in your business, take a step back in your family, and uh, regularly analyze whether or not what you're doing or your approach to what you're doing is the best way to do it. That may be a weekly meeting. That may be a weekly family meeting. That may be a weekly business meeting. That may be a monthly meeting. Whatever God tells you to do, but you always want to be assessing whether or not you're being effective in what you're doing. And again, what does effective mean? Effective is what you define as effective. Success is what you define as success. It's not trying to mimic what everyone else is doing. It's what you define and wrote down. So you go back to what you wrote and you say, all right, we said we were going to do this and we did that. We said we were going to do this and we did that. So we've been successful. We've done the things that we set out to do. Not, well, we're not, look at us and look at them. Um, no, success is, like we said, what you define at the beginning would be your success. So we want to move from busy to being effective. Um, so let's say that we set a deadline. The deadline comes and goes, and we've not accomplished our task. What do we do? Well, of course, Brian, we just quit. We throw it all away. We tear up the paper, throw it in the trash, and we go play golf. No! That's not right. We set another deadline. We missed the first one for whatever reason. Maybe it was an unrealistic deadline that we gave ourselves. Again, you want to figure out the verse that we read in Luke, what, I, what, am I, what am I working with and do I have enough to finish, right? So you may have set an unrealistic deadline. You learn the lesson and you don't do that again. You do something that vibes with where you are and your growth in Christ. You do what you can handle. You take on what you can handle and trust that you learn in taking on what you can handle and you get stronger and bigger and you're able to take on more, right? But don't set unrealistic 
deadlines and goals that you know and believe through and through within your being that you're not going to do. Right? Start with something that you can handle. Maybe, maybe it stretches you a little bit. Right? But you don't want to stretch to the point of breaking. When you give your children a task to do, maybe you want to give them something that stretches them a little bit, but you don't want to break them. Because if you break them, they don't want to do it again because they feel defeated. And sometimes we feel defeated because we've given ourselves unrealistic expectations of, of, hit, of getting to this. We're trying to get here and we need to be going right here. Right. So you want to take on what you can handle. Um, and if you miss the deadline, you set another deadline. You realize, you, you, you learn and you understand why you missed the deadline and maybe you get better, right? But you don't scrap the whole thing, right? You set another deadline and you go for it. Why? Because we don't quit. We don't stop. If we don't quit, we win, all right? Um, never stop progressing. There is no place to quit or give up in the kingdom of God. We need to have a start date as well as a deadline, all right? So... Um, we're getting all this great teaching and revelation over these uh, few nights that we've, these few sessions that we've been in. Um, and maybe these sessions um, have inspired some things in you, right? And you kind of, right, sitting in your seat or walking out of here or coming into here, you're like, oh, you know, I see this. We got to get this done. And I want to do this. And I want to do this. Well, you're not going to do everything at one time. If you've, if, you, if you've never done anything, you're not going to do everything by next week. So find one thing. What are you going to do? What is your goal going to be? Right. And set a start date for it. When are you when are you going to start? Well, I'll start. I'll start. I'll, I'll come up with something. I'll start. I'll start when I feel like starting. I'll start right now. It's not a good week. It, you know, um, you know, stuff going on. You know, I'll get a, I'll get around to it. Yeah, you probably won't. Unless it's a disciplined part of you, you probably won't, right? So you need discipline until change comes. You need structure until change comes, right? A person who's been changed doesn't need discipline, right? It's only a person who has not been changed that needs a law, right? That's the person that needs structure. But at some point in time, when you've been disciplining yourself, you go from needing to disciplining yourself to that's a part of you. That's a part of your makeup. That's a part of your being. And you do it naturally. It flows out of you. But before that, you need discipline. You need structure. And that's why kids need discipline. Right. Because they're not old enough, mature enough yet for it to be inherent in who they are. Right. Um, I'm 39 years old now. You can't get me to play with Tonka toys. You know, you can't. Um, when I was little, my parents had to set some rules behind some of the games and toys that I was playing with that I had to go to bed at this time. Why? Because if they didn't set those structures or those boundaries, I would, if, they, if I didn't have that discipline, I would have played all night. Now you can't get me to play it. Why? It's not a part of my makeup anymore. You know, when I was a child, I did childish things. But now that I'm a man, I do manly things. I do play a game every now and then. But anyway, all right, um, basketball. Um, so we need to have a start date as well as a deadline. So there's a question for us. Which is harder, starting something or finishing something? For some people, it may be hard for them to get started. For some people, they get real excited and it's hard for them to finish it. You know, um, the enemy of starting is procrastination. The enemy of finishing is distraction. I got started. I was excited. But then this happened. This circumstance arose and I got off track and I never got back on. And now it's been 10 years and I no closer to my dream than when I started. All right. The clock is ticking. Time waits for no man. It keeps moving. We should do the same. Keep moving in the direction of our goals and dreams. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year, every decade, every century counts. All right. 
We'll see how far we can get here in the next few minutes. List obstacles, identify opportunities, survey the territory. One of the quotes from, um, directly from the book here is, let's not allow life's obstacles to prevent us from pursuing and ultimately reaching our dreams. Some will view the pursuit as being too hard and stop. So the revelation here is that there will be obstacles on your way to your goal on your way to your dream. There are going to be obstacles, okay? Now, I'm not saying, you know, God, I believe you for obstacles. You know, no, I'm not. They're going to come by themselves. You don't have to be in faith for obstacles, okay? Um, you don't have to be in faith that Jesus Christ is going to return. He will return whether you're in faith or not, okay? Obstacles are going to come whenever they come. It's important to know that when they come, you already have the victory, so there will be obstacles to overcome. The devil and the world system will try to stop you. View them as an opportunity to demonstrate the victory of Christ, not something that will stop you. Take inventory of known obstacles for the sake of perspective. What obstacles might you confront if your dream is to start your own business, if your dream is to go into nursing, if your dream is to be a doctor, if your dream is to be a banker, if your dream is to have a worldwide ministry, what obstacles might you face? Not to be uh, afraid, not to be scared, but to be, to have some perspective that this is the person or the challenger. If you're a boxer and you're a champion, you're going to be in the ring with someone. There's nothing wrong with understanding who you're going to be in the ring with but it doesn't mean you're going to lose. It's just that you understand who you're going to be beating. Take inventory of known obstacles. Every journey has a route. Sometimes that route includes going through the valley of the shadow of death and the fiery furnace. But the Lord is with you at work in you. He lives on the inside of you the whole way. He will be there in you at work, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure, even if you go through the fiery furnace. When we experience the doldrums, we should refrain from any from making any major decisions. When you are at a point where you feel like "Mm, I kind of lost some traction here. Things were moving pretty good. A lot was happening. A lot was manifesting. There was some activity. I had some clear direction. I was having some successes, some incremental wins. Um, And I've gotten to a season where it's like uh, things are okay, but they're not as going as great and as quick as they used to be. If you reach that point in time of try to avoid making any major decisions at those times, if you don't have clear direction, do what you need to do to keep the lights on. But don't venture out into uh, big things that you don't have direction about, right? You want to avoid or refrain from making any major decisions. The winds will blow again. Wait for the manifestation of the breakthrough. Identify opportunities. Make a list of the current opportunities of which you are aware that will help you meet your goal. There may be opportunities that you're aware of that will, that may assist and help get you into a house. And I'm not talking about government opportunities. I'm talking about divinely placed opportunities um, that may include people, situations, conversations, circumstances. You heard this, you know, someone selling this. You heard they were looking to buy this. They were looking to make a move here. This move may align with your move. It could be a number of different equations here in the divine purpose of God. But um, you want to be aware of any opportunities that may be there. The widow woman um, with the jar of oil um, had to assess what she had in her house. She had an opportunity in her house already. The prophet said, what do you have? Mm, I got a jar of oil. I can work with that. The prophet said, let's use that. Let's use that as a starting point. What do you have in your house? 
What embedded opportunities has God already put in your life? What people has he connected, connected you to already that can help facilitate where you want to go and what you want to accomplish? Opportunities. The word port is in the word opportunities. What is a port? A port is a place of trade, commerce, and activity where things have the potential to happen. Ports in our business lives may include networking meetings, meetings where you're able to network with other people and identify opportunities that may be there for you to go into. But if you don't go to those networking meetings as God leads you to, then you're missing out on a piece of the ingredient that's going to get you to the ultimate recipe. Right. So this is where it comes in and we've got to be putting feet to what it is that we've defined here, to what it is that we've written down as our goal. We've got to be putting activity to our dream. That means that we have to be out there where the opportunities are. We have to be out there where the opportunities are embedded and be active in those things. Brian, I don't know where to start. Well, typically these journeys start with some research. If you're going to start a business, what do you not know that you need to know? If you're going to purchase a house, what do you not know that you need to know? Okay. Um, you may not be looking at the full picture of person purchasing the house. You may just be looking at the purchase price. You may want to look at the taxes. You may want to look at the upkeep. You may want to look at the potential utility bills and make sure that you have the right perspective. But there's research to be done around your dream. If you feel like God is directing you to go into a particular field, right, a particular sphere, then you want to research that sphere. What are the opportunities that are in that sphere? What platforms exist that I can stand on to preach the gospel? Right. There are platforms embedded in certain certain spheres. That platform may be success. When you have success, people will listen to you. That's a platform to be able to share the gospel. Right. But you want to be out there. You want to be active. And there are ports within opportunity in our business lives. It may be networking meetings. It may be trade shows. It may be industry business conferences or office meetings. I could do this or I could do that. I could go here or I could go there. Make sure you take advantage of the right opportunities. We want spirit inspired and spirit led opportunities. One of the most often overlooked opportunities we each have is to become really proficient at our current responsibilities. So if you're currently working a job or you're currently involved in a particular part of a ministry, an opportunity there could be to become the best at what you're currently doing. That gives you opportunities to move up and move into other areas as people who are in other spheres, who maybe God is divinely positioned there to bring you through those doors, recognize your efforts, recognize how good you've gotten at certain things. Um, we call this principle being brilliant at the basics, being brilliant at the basics. What's in your hand? Make sure that you're being faithful with the little. And we'll walk through this, le this, this last section here uh, very, very quickly. We'll be at the end of session two. Identify information, list resources, research. What informational resources, books, articles, seminars, videos, people are out there which will help you on your journey? Again, research. Find people who have done what you plan to do. Hang around people who are going where you plan to be. That means that you want to at least be hanging around people that are going in the same direction as you. OK, um, young people, you want to make sure that you're hanging around people that are going the same direction that you're going. Right. Because if you're not, they're going to bring you down. Learn what you can learn from them. Learn from their failures and successes. Why go through the pain they went through if you don't have to? Why reinvent the wheel if it's already been invented? Proverbs 4 and verse 7. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. 
Wisdom and understanding are valuable. Surround yourself with as much of it as possible. Surround yourself with books. One thing that you'll notice about the wealthy is that they have big libraries. One thing that you'll notice about the poor is that they have big screen televisions. <clears throat> now, there's nothing wrong with having a big screen television. Um, if I had a problem with that, then I'd have to go home and make some changes right now. <laughs> but here, we can't sacrifice equipping ourselves with the information, knowledge, and insights that we need for our journey, for our dream, at the expense of entertainment. Entertainment should be viewed as dessert. But it is not vegetables, it's not protein, it's not meat, um, it's not milk, it's not cheese, it's not part of the, uh, the critical food groups that make you healthy, right? It's, it's enjoyable, and it's fun to do, just like dessert. I really enjoy homemade vanilla bluebell ice cream, but I can't live on it. I can't live on it. I enjoy uh, banana pudding, but I can't live on, I can't eat banana pudding in the natural, just naturally speaking, I would ultimately um, start to deteriorate in my body, right? If I live on entertainment, I'll never achieve my dream. I'll be a spiritual infant. I'll be a kingdom of God infant. Now. I want to enjoy the things that God has put here for us to, for us to enjoy. Um, and I enjoy doing a lot of different things. I enjoy entertainment. Entertainment's fun, but I can't live on it, right? So you have to put it in its place. You have to rule and reign over it. And you have to, um, when, you, when you work hard, then it's okay to play hard. Reward yourself, you know? Make sure that Go and have vacation. Go and have some fun. Go and watch some movies, whatever. But plan for it. Make sure it's a part of your, of your operation of getting some rest, of getting some R&R. But once you've done, an, you've done what's reasonable to do there, you've got to get back to work. Okay? So the last thing here, the greatest resource of wisdom is the Holy Spirit. Open yourself to his leading and expect to receive guidance from him. There is an information exercise here. Uh, make a list of information that you will need to gather, what books you will need to read, or what courses you will have to take. The list should include at least five resources that you are going to tap into to do your research. If you can come up with more, that's great, but start with at least five. All right, praise God. It's been a good night, good word. T tomorrow night we'll pick up on session three. And um, then we'll be done for now. Pastor Jim.